Hello everybody and welcome back to Forget Me Not The Missing Podcast. I hope you're all well this week. You may have noticed there was not an episode last week and I did put an announcement on social media but for those who didn't see it, I'm moving this episode now to every other week and that's only because I'm working full time and doing my part-time master's degree as well as trying to do everything else in my life so then doing the podcast on top of that every week is just unrealistic. I don't have the time at the moment. So I'm moving it to every other week only because I want to make sure that the quality is good. I'd rather have less episodes of a better quality than rush out an episode every week and it not be as good and you guys not enjoy it as much. This gives me just a bit more time to do the research so it's a more in-depth episode because I did notice like on the week of Susie Lamplew's episode, I was really busy. So then it ends up being a short episode and I wish I would have had time to do more research into it. So yeah, I'm just moving it to every other week. Hopefully in the future I can, you know, take some time off work and just stockpile a load of episodes. And then hopefully then um, I'll be able to push them out again every week. But for now, we're gonna do it this way. So anyways, enough small talk, let's move into this episode. And it's gonna be an interesting episode because it's about somebody that you might know for reasons other than his disappearance. So this week, we're gonna be talking about Richie Edwards. And for those of you who don't know, Richie Edwards is a Welsh musician who was the lyricist and rhythm guitarist of the rock band Manic Street Preachers. And if you don't know who Richie is, I would be surprised if you haven't heard of Manic Street Preachers because they're a pretty well-known band. If you haven't heard about them, then I definitely recommend you go and listen to them. So Richie Edwards was born Richard James Edwards on the 22nd of December, 1967. And he also is known as Richie James or Richie Manic. The guitarist vanished on the 1st of February 1995 and is widely presumed to have taken his own life but a body has never been found and there's been no definite proof uncovered that he actually did die by suicide and this has led to several theories that Richie is actually still alive and staged his disappearance in order to start a new life and this is 100% what I think happened. I think Richie's still alive. I don't think he killed himself. If he maybe has died in the years since, I don't know but I don't think that he killed himself on the 1st of February 1995 and as we get into this episode you'll form your own theories but I think that you might think the same. So on the day that Richie disappeared he was due to fly to the US on a promotional tour with Manic Street Preachers of the album The Holy Bible. He was staying at the Embassy Hotel on Bayswater Road and on the day of his disappearance he checked out at 7am taking with him his wallet, his keys, passport and some Prozac. He left his toiletries, his suitcase and some other medication. He left some of his Prozac there, he only took a handful with him. He then got in his car and he drove back towards Wales. Two weeks later, his car was found abandoned at the Seven View service station, which is close to the Seven Bridge. And for those of you who don't know the UK or aren't familiar with this part of the world, the Seven Bridge is now called the Prince of Wales Bridge. And it's the bridge that links England and Wales. It goes over the over the water. <laughs> and in the days, it's no longer a toll anymore, uh, but it used to be a toll uh, bridge where you'd have to pay to cross and a toll booth receipt was actually recovered from uh, Richie's car when it was found to confirm that he had actually crossed the bridge on the day he's fa- he vanished. His passport, his medication, and the like I said, the receipt was found in his car. And on the receipt, it said that he crossed the bridge at 2.55. And at the time, that was believed to be 2.55 p.m., but after further checks years later, it found that the toll booth actually had a 24 hour clock at that time and 2.55 would have meant 2.55 a.m., which throws the timeline off and has caused problems since in the investigation because it turned out they were looking at the complete wrong time of day. So they're appealing for witness sightings in the afternoon when they should have been looking for early hours of the morning. The reason his car was actually found is because he received a parking ticket and then the car remained there. And then on the 17th of February, the vehicle was reported as abandoned by people who worked in that service station. So when police got to the car, they found that the battery was dead and it looked like the car had been lived in for some time. The car also had photos in it that Richard taken of his family in the days prior to his disappearance. In the two weeks before his disappearance, Richie withdrew £200 a day from his bank account, which totaled £2,800 by the day of his flight to America. So some people speculated that he was doing this because he was getting cash out for his trip to America. And it was also mentioned that maybe it's because he had ordered a new desk for his flat from a shop in Cardiff. So it was taking the money out to pay for the desk in cash. But 
There's no record the desk was ever paid for. And also the desk wasn't worth 2,800 quid. It was worth about half of that. So that would have uh, not accounted for the rest of the money. So I suppose, yes, he could have been using it for America. But I don't know, to me, if you're doing it in different chunks like that, you're taking it out at different chunks so people don't notice you're taking it out, in my opinion. So to me, I think, with many others think that he was actually withdrawing this money as part of his grand scheme to disappear. So in the book, A Version of Reason, it was said, quote, the night before he disappeared, Edwards gave a friend a book called Novel with Cocaine, instructing her to read the introduction, which details the author sing in a mental asylum before vanishing. So this is actually quite interesting because Richie had actually spent some time in the Witchurch Hospital in Cardiff, uh, which is a hospital for people who are struggling with mental health issues. Back to him being at the Bayswater, the MC Hotel, sorry, in Bayswater Road, London, According to a biography about his disappearance, Richie actually removed some books and videos from his bag, and among them was a copy of the play called, and I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, Equus? Equus? <laughs> E-Q-U-U-S. So Richie actually wrapped them carefully in a box with a note that said, I love you. And then he decorated the box like a birthday present and also put on the outside of the box some collages and some literary quotations. And this actually also included a picture of a Germanic looking house and Bugs Bunny, which some people say maybe these are clues to something about maybe where he's going or maybe he just liked the look of them. The package was addressed to Richie's on and off girlfriend, Joe, who he had met years prior. However, they had split a few weeks earlier to his disappearance, which some say may have sparked him deciding to up and leave. But I don't know, you could take this either two ways. Maybe he was going to kill himself, so he wanted to leave a gift, or maybe, you know, that was just his like farewell gift to go off and start a new life. I mean, I don't know what that play meant to him. It could have meant something deeper. It's probably worth looking into. Actually, I'm gonna look into it right now. <laughs> okay, so I've just done a bit of a Wikipedia search. I'm so uncul uncultured. But anyway, so this play, actually kind of interesting. So it's about um, a psychiatrist who attempts to treat a young man who has a pathological religious fascination with horses. So that might sound like, okay, what's that got to do with Richie Edwards? But as you read on, it says that the psych psychiatrist is attempting to understand the cause of the boy's actions whilst wrestling with his own sense of purpose. And this sense of purpose is something that Richie Edwards really struggled with because Manic were getting big, they were getting famous, but there's like people saying that he didn't want to be, you know, this sort of stage sort of character he didn't know he loved the band but he didn't know if that's where he wanted to go in his life so that's quite interesting it could mean something i mean i don't know but we're thinking about i suppose i suppose this leads us on to why would he decide to disappear if he was doing so well in life and actually it's not as cut and dry as you may think because i thought the same i was like well this is just before Manic made it big. They were going to go to America. They were going to travel the world. And actually, I listened to a really interesting interview from Richie, which was from a year, few years before he went missing. And he said, well, yeah, so what? You go to, you know, America, Greece, you travel the world, and then you come back, and it's the same when you come back, which is a bit of a depressing way to look at things. But I don't know. It shows that he's kind of struggling with his, his purpose and what he wants to do in life. So he's enjoying going away, but then when he comes back, he's like, well... It's the same every day. So that that's kind of like, it's, it's sad to hear, especially with somebody who was so, like he had no idea at this point, I think, what, what was at his doorstep, like how big Manic were gonna get. But anyways, back to it. So in the weeks before the release of the Holy Bible, he told his management that he needed psychiatric, psychi I can't, I can't even speak. Psych, <laughs> what's wrong with me? Psychiatric health. He was suffering from nervous exhaustion and clinical depression. Now, this isn't the first time he'd struggled with his mental illness. So at the age of 22, Richie was at university and he weighed only six stone, which I don't think I've weighed six stone since I was like six years old. So um, he wasn't eating, he was drinking a lot of alcohol and he wasn't sleeping because he didn't want to sleep because that's when his thoughts were like got bad. So he would just stay up and get drunk until he drunk himself to the point that he would basically pass out, so then he didn't have to think, which 
it's so sad but I can absolutely relate with how sometimes you want to go to bed and your brain just goes into overdrive and it is the worst feeling so I really do empathize with him I mean I obviously have never experienced it on this level but yeah no that's sad so that shows like from a young age how much Richie actually did struggle in his own head which is so sad because I think as well probably I mean I don't know because I was only two in 1995 but maybe at that time because I think even in the last few years we've made such leaps and bounds with mental health like grown up I don't remember ever being like a discussion it was a bit of a taboo so I wonder if he had the help that he needed at that time so his friend James who's like his best friend from university actually describes how in university that's when he first pub like saw Richie publicly self-harm so Richie had been self-harming but this one day I think he said they were in the light the library and he literally just got a compass and just started cutting himself in front of everybody which is terrifying I don't know what I would do in that situation because yeah that just screams somebody who just needs needs help so in 1994, the year before Richie disappeared, he'd moved out of his parents' home. And for the first few months of the year, um, when he had moved out, he was smoking 40 cigarettes a day and drinking a bottle and a half of vodka a day. And the problems that I discussed about him struggling to fall asleep at university had escalated to this point, to the point where he was actually scared to sleep because when he tried to sleep, his thoughts were so intrusive, it scared him. He tried sleeping pills, he didn't like them either. So then he went back to what I described before which he described as a quote blank sleep which means you drink yourself to oblivion and just pass out. In April of 1994 when Manic Street Peaches toured Bangkok Richie's second public display of self-harm happened and this is so messed up like people are so messed up so he'd been given a set of knives by a fan at a gig who asked him to look at her while he cut himself. Like, she's the one who needs to get some help because that is fucked up. Excuse my language, but that is messed up. That's not right. He was horrified, as you would, and he told her, I'm not going to be anyone's circus sideshow freak. But despite saying this, he was in such a bad place mentally, he actually did take the knives backstage and he cut his torso and then walked back on stage and carried the show. So he took the knives, self-harmed, and then carried on, which I don't even know what to say about that. To me, that screams somebody who needs help, like I said before. Anybody who's doing it in public to that extent is is crying for help. But yeah, it didn't, didn't happen at that point. So when uh, Richie did actually ask for help, prior to the Holy Bible tour, it was actually described as unexpected that he asked for help, which seems strange to me, given his behavior the previous year, like the self-mutilation and things like that, and the long pattern of not being able to sleep, drinking himself to sleep, being scared to go to bed. So to me, for <laughs> somebody to ask for help, and that being considered as unexpected is a bit strange to me, but people, for example, his best friend James said that he was such a manic depressant that he was so up, down, up, down, even when he was down, because he'd be fine, and he'd then been fine, people didn't realise he was actually down, and I know, I don't know, I suppose back in the day there wasn't as much awareness of mental health, so maybe people didn't think that, you know, being up, down, up, down wasn't like, oh yeah, he's happy one day, he feels crap the next, it's like that's part of the depression, because he had manic depression. So actually describing it, his best friend James said, there's a trigger in him that he can't control. He has a mental illness, it's not schizophrenia or anything like that, he's mentally ill, manic depression. I find it interesting though, despite all of these troubles that he was going through, he was actually really self-aware, so it was him who actually asked for help. It was him who said, yeah, I wanna get checked in, which, show some level of self-awareness of him, which makes me think like, you know, if he did make the decision to disappear and start a new life, it wasn't completely not thought out because it shows that he was self-aware, he knew what was going on. And even talking about it, he's like, yeah, I drink myself to sleep because I'm scared of my thoughts. So it's not that he doesn't know why he's drinking. He's a very self-aware individual, which I think is really interesting. And I think like for somebody to be, you know, that much in their own head, and it wouldn't surprise me if he's like sitting there planning out this new start to life to escape this like old life that's just causing him so much pain and anguish so when he did actually go into Whitchurch hospital he was on the verge of anorexia and when he was in the hospital what they did to treat him was they just drugged him with 
on Prozac, but to the point where he couldn't even talk. And because of this, his management were like, this isn't helping, this isn't going to make him better. So they took him to a priory, uh, to a, sorry, to a private clinic, which was Priory in Roehampton. And in the following months after this, before his disappearance, before the American tour, the Manistry Peaches actually played Glasgow's Tea in the Park Festival and Ren Festival uh, without Richie. So this would have been in 1994, I believe. So the year before he disappeared, they played the shows without Richie because he was getting help. And three months later, so say this is autumn 1994, he reappeared looking relatively healthy and he looked to be functioning norm, like normal, you know, as people say, um, or people say that he was actually like, for him, normal. I mean, I, I don't want to use the word normal because what's normal, but you know what I'm trying to get at. So he had been prescribed Prozac to combat his depression. He had agreed to do interviews about what had happened to him and he was quite candid about his experiences and on the 12-step recovery plan that he was on. And he talked positively about what was coming up in the future. He talked positively about going on tour and he was looking forward to playing some dates in Europe to ease himself back onto the road, playing live before the American tour. So, with everything looking on the up, what what happened? That is the big question. And there's several theories about now this disappearance or the apparent suicide or who even knows what happened. So years later, a book was released called Withdrawn Traces, Searching for the Truth About Richie Manick and was written by Sarah Hayes, I want to say how you pronounce it, Sarah Hayes Roberts and Leon Noakes. I'm, I'm really bad at pronouncing names, I'm sorry. Uh, but they shed some fresh light on his disappearance. And this was a few years ago that they released this book. So they were like basically going over evidence that had been kind of not omitted or forgotten about, but just people maybe weren't aware of that suggested that he didn't actually kill himself at all. Firstly, there was the fact that members of his family had similarly disappeared and isolated themselves um, from their relatives and their family. So for example, when Richie was younger, his own uncle disappeared for 10 years. He moved to Texas in the 60s and 70s and just disappeared for 10 years before resurfacing. And apparently according to family members Richie was like obsessed with this like he couldn't believe that somebody had done that and he was like obsessed with how he managed to do it completely fascinated with it and actually like wrote a lot in his schoolwork about it like disappearing and just going no just literally vanishing like it, it was just something he was really interested in he also had an extensive library of books and many of them refer to the life of disappearance and a life in exile so all of this suggests that like it's something that he considered from a young age after getting fascinated with it and being interested in it i don't know to me that suggests that he's been thinking about this for a long long time but who knows so there was another theory about his disappearance was that he actually had undiagnosed Asperger's and like experts have said that one trait of this can be shutting out the world as a way of coping. In the book, they suggest that maybe this, and his sister said uh, that he, she thinks that he might have had Asperger's disorder and does give some credit to this theory that maybe he just didn't know how to cope with it, didn't know how to cope with people, felt misunderstood, felt like he didn't fit in anywhere. So just shut out the world and just disappeared. So there was also a sighting of Richie on the Seven Bridge on the 1st of February 1995 that didn't come to light until later years. And it was somebody called David Rasmus and he said that he spotted Richie on the footpath of the Seven Bridge and he said that he had no transport and the only way he could access the bridge was the foot footpath. And he is convinced without a shadow of a doubt that the young lad was actually Richie. And David describes how he was, at the time, he was so concerned of the state that the individual, that he actually made a detour and walked to the bridge office to report it. And the person that he reported to didn't didn't really pay much credence to it. Maybe they seen people, I mean, it was quite a well-known suicide spot. So I don't know if, I mean, which makes me think they should log and report it, but maybe they just thought, oh yeah, we always see people walking across here, which I don't know strange but uh yeah he said basically the person who he reported to didn't even ask for his name it was just a night security guard don't even know if it was logged which is such a shame because maybe if it was logged at the time there could have been some more inquiries into who it was was it richie we'll never know it's too late now to go back and look over that so it's another 
theory about his disappearance, which is quite interesting. So he supposedly met with, when he was in Whitchurch Hospital, he spoke to a woman who later decided to just disappear and go to Israel. And in his last weeks, Richie actually said to his sister that he wanted to go to Israel and he even got a tattoo that sort of pointed towards this idea and there's actually a photo shoot and he's showing off this new tattoo and it people say oh it looks like he was purposely showing the tattoo so people say oh maybe that was like a clue that he was purposely showing this tattoo because he wanted everyone to see this tattoo of Israel and people be like oh that's where he is but anyways when they were writing this book one of the authors went to the hairdresser and was just speaking about you know writing this book and about Richie and um, the hairdresser apparently just turned around really bluntly and was like, well, he's living in kibbutz in Israel and everybody knows that from around here. So that's interesting. That's like, people. I mean, it could have come from the rumour from this woman in the hospital or maybe there's a bit more, you know, credence to it. If he had the tattoo, he said that he wanted to go, he met a woman who was there, you just never know. And in case you're wondering what the tattoo was, uh, he had it in late 1994, so just before he disappeared. And it was a diagram of the entry to hell below Jerusalem. And it was based on an illustration from a 1949 version of Dante's The Divine Comedy. I'll put a photo on the blog online so you can see and see what you think about it. There's another theory that maybe, you know, Richie came across somebody in his life who threatened him. So he disappeared after coming into confrontation with somebody, which... I suppose you can never discount, like, why would somebody literally just want to leave? Maybe they were scared, but there's not really any evidence of this, but the authors of the book say, well, you can't really discount it because you don't know really who he was mixing with at the time. And now going back to that gift box that he left on the hotel bed the day he disappeared for his ex-girlfriend, the book that I said he left was called Novel with Cocaine. I don't know anything about this book, but interestingly, the author of this book handed over this manuscript for publication and then disappeared and he was never heard about again and people think he went and started a new life so maybe that's another clue like there seems to be so many little clues to me I just think there's so many little seeds that he seems to be leaving around like yes I disappeared like to me so far other than the fact he struggled with depression there's nothing that says he killed himself and I mean I know you never know what's going on on the inside of somebody's mind but he didn't seem to be in a bad place. And I know you can't say, oh, well, he was smiling, so because you just don't know. But like, for example, Chester Bennington, before he sadly killed himself after the lead singer from Lincoln Park, Lincoln Park, he had photos with his wife smiling like two or three days before he passed. So you don't know, but I don't know. To me, there seems to be, in this case, more evidence that he wanted to start a new life rather than he wanted to end his life. So another theory, which is also very interesting, is... A woman called Vivian, and it's a big it's a big mystery. So this woman was supposedly in the hotel room with him the night before he vanished, and she's never been found. No one knows who she is. No one knows if her name's even Vivian. Like, nobody knows. But apparently, he tried to give her his passport, saying, I won't be needing this anymore, quote-unquote. And the author of the book says, yeah, this did happen, but we don't know much about her. We know she was in the hotel room. I don't know how. I don't know if it's like an old statement or something. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but she was in the hotel room with Richie the night before he vanished, but they've not been able to track it down since, which to me suggests maybe she put a statement in and then no one knows. Maybe she changed her name. Maybe she got married. You just don't know. But yeah, that's interesting. But then also that, that doesn't mean that he... I mean, that could mean two things, isn't it? Like, if he started a new life, maybe he would need his passport. Um, or maybe, you know, he won't need it because he didn't, he wasn't going to be here anymore. We just don't know. I feel like that's all I keep saying through this is we just don't know. But we generally just don't know. It's just so much mystery around this case. It's so fascinating. And just like, obviously I've done my research and I've written all this up and I'm talking about it. But the more I talk about it and the more I go over what I've written and the more I'm actually saying it out loud, I'm like, this guy didn't kill himself I just really don't believe it because just it's just the whole thing about how obsessed he was with disappearing I don't know you guys will have to let me know what you think so let's go on to some sightings now because this also obviously adds to the theory that he's still alive because some people have claimed that they've seen him they've seen him about so firstly we obviously had that oh well he's in Israel everybody knows that but we actually have had some physical sightings. So there was a sighting, supposedly, of him in Goa and on the hippie trail in Goa. 
I don't really know. The Hippie Trail is quite a popular tourist spot, but back in the day, it was people would go there in search of something. So I don't think that's outside the possibilities from what we've discussed about Richie, that that could be something that he did to try and find some purpose. And there's also um, rumours that he was seen in Thailand in 2004. And this then developed, I don't know if it's Chinese whispers, but people said, oh yeah, he was there in 2004. And four, and then therefore died in the Boxing Day tsunami, which I can't believe was in 2004. What the hell? Is that right? That can't be right. That makes me feel so. Oh, I just had to Google it, and it was 2004. Oh my god. Wow. I literally remember that. Um, so yeah, so people saying, well, yeah, he was traveling in 2004, he was in Thailand, and then sadly succumbed to the tsunami, and maybe he was you know, intending to come back like his uncle did, like disappear for 10 years and then resurface, but never had the opportunity because of this natural disaster. He sadly didn't make it. Another sighting of Richie was in the two weeks that followed his disappearance. He apparently was spotted in the Newport Passport office and at the Newport at Newport bus station, which interesting, he was at the passport office, if it was him, because he had his passport, which suggests to me Was he getting a passport with a new identity? Something to consider. But yeah, a fan supposedly saw him and actually spoke to him at the bus station. And um, she didn't know that he was missing at the time. And she supposedly had a full-on conversation with him and discussed a mutual friend called Laurie Fiddler before he got on the bus and left. So that's quite a specific sighting. To me, I think there's quite... You can give some you know, legitimacy to that because she knew the band, she knew who he was, they had a mutual friend and they talked about it. So I would actually give some credence to that. I think that was quite not beyond the realms of possibility that he was there. Maybe, you know, because the last place he seen was the Seven Bridge and what comes after the Seven Bridge, Newport, he had a flat in Cardiff. I don't know, that that all to me ties in very nicely, but who knows? I think I need like that to be the quote because I feel like that's, I either say, but anyways, or who knows. These seem to be the two things I keep catching myself saying. But anyways, <laughs> on the 7th of February, he was actually seen again, supposedly, by a taxi driver, again from Newport, who said that he picked him, he picked Richie up from the King's Hotel and then drove him around the valleys, including Richie's hometown of Blackwood. And the driver actually said that the passenger had spoken in a Cockney accent, which occasionally slipped into a Welsh one, and that he had asked if he could lie down on the back seat so as to not be seen. Eventually, they went to Blackwood and to the bus and bus. <laughs> they went to Blackwood and to the bus station, but the passenger reportedly said, "No, this isn't the place," and then asked to be t- taken to Pontypool railway station. I couldn't find then the exact details of all of this, but then apparently Pontypool railway station wasn't the place because it didn't have a telephone. So I don't really know, but. The passenger, who is claimed to have been Richie, then supposedly got out at the Seven View service station and then paid £68 fare in cash. I mean, I don't really know. I don't know what to think about this one. So, for this to be true, he'd, so he left his car at the service station, the same service station, and then managed to get to Newport, whether he hitchhiked or what. So he crossed the Seven Bridge, left his car there, went to Newport, stayed in a hotel in Newport, got a taxi to drive him around the area where he grew up, and then went to two different railway stations before deciding, no, he wanted to go back to the Seven Bridge. I don't know. What do you guys think of that? Why would he be going back? Because... He didn't go back and get his car unless he went back because there was stuff in his car that he wanted because this was this was 10 days before his car was actually reported as abandoned so maybe he went back to get something from his car before heading on to the next place but I don't know to me that sounds like a risky plan if you wanted to disappear so I'm not sure how I th- how I feel about this one but who knows hey who knows <laughs> but yeah so that was like those were the key sightings and there's there's not been any other sightings that I'm aware of in the days since any of these. So that would mean the most recent sighting was in Thailand in 2004. And I guess that's why there's this theory that he did die then in the Boxing Day tsunami because 
He's literally not been seen since 2004. So I can see that. I can see why people are saying that. But I'd, I'd love to know what you guys think about this one. I think it's so strange. I mean, I do think that they would have recovered a body if he had committed suicide there. I do think that. And I think if there was people around who saw, supposedly saw him walking around the bridge, like somebody must have seen something if he decided to. I don't know. It's such a shame that they couldn't identify anybody. Like he would have had to hitchhike. He's not walking from the Seven Bridge to Newport. He would have had to... It would have had to got a lift. I just don't understand how we got there. So it's just a shame that there's no signs of, oh yeah, I seen him, I picked him up, I dropped him off. That would literally make everything fit into place for me. But it's just that time gap. And I think a lot of the reason there is that time gap is because they were looking at the wrong time of day because they were looking at 2.55 in the afternoon, not in the a.m. It's such a shame. And I know that's something that his sister has touched upon that it's so, they seem to have wasted all these years looking at the wrong eight hours of time. So that, that's sad. That is sad because I think that because of that little error, I mean, to me, it's like, why would you just assume 2.55 means 2.55 p.m.? To me, 14.55, I would assume. <laughs> but if, if I saw 2.55, and I don't know if that's just because I've been in the military, so I work off that sort of clock, but... To me, if I saw 2.55, I would think early hours of the morning. I wouldn't think afternoon, but yeah, I don't know. You'd think that that is something that would be checked pretty bloody quickly. Like, okay, let's assert, ascertain exactly what time this is. I feel like I'm rambling this episode, but I literally, my brain's going over time trying to figure this one out. But I don't think he killed himself. To, to conclude, I don't think he killed himself. I think he purposely disappeared. He'd obviously been fascinated it. There's a few clues in there. There's quite a few possible sightings. And his body's never been found. I mean, I do wonder if he is still alive to this day. I wonder if he has passed away. Maybe he did end up struggling too much with his mental health. Or, you know, maybe he got sick or... Maybe he did die in the tsunami. We we will never know unless someone comes forward or he himself comes forward. I mean, obviously the ideal solution is that he's somewhere living a happy life. He's fallen in love. He's got a family and he's put all of this behind him. His parents have both passed, passed away, I believe. I think it's just his, ser- his sister now. But don't quote me on that. I know it's sad. It's a really sad story. I mean, if he disappeared because he wanted to disappear and he's happy, then I'd love that. But... So many people, it just, it's a sad story in the sense that I feel like I wish he'd had the help he needed and I wish he'd only knew what was coming. But then also maybe, like, you know, celebrity life, famous life isn't for anybody. And I think for somebody like Richie, who seemed to struggle with his purpose and struggle with the attention he was getting, maybe it would have been too much for him. And maybe that's why he disappeared to start a new life because he just wanted, wanted a bit of a break, you know. But anyways, sorry for rambling. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, We'll be back in two weeks. I think I'm going to do a lady from Cardiff. I know these seem to be Welsh focused but I am from Wales um it might not I'm trying to do a a bit of a mix where I do men children women so I've done two young girls I've done a child I've done Richie today I'm thinking of doing like a middle-aged woman next um one that's quite you know still quite prominent happened a few years ago but I, I don't know don't quote me on it uh we'll see I'll let you know so that'll be coming in a couple of weeks time I hope you enjoyed this episode. I honestly really, really, really want to know what you guys think about this one because this one to me is just mad. I think most of you will agree with me that he's still alive though, but who knows. Anyways, I hope you have a lovely couple of weeks. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll speak to you soon.